Good morning and welcome to Cirrus Pharmaceuticals fourth quarter and full year 2023 financial results conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. This call is being webcast live on the Investors and Media section of Cirrus website at www.cirrus.com. Please be advised that today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Karen Hunati, Director of Investor Relations and Corporate Communications at Cirrus. Thank you. This morning, we issued a press release announcing our fourth quarter and full year 2023 financial results. The full release is available on the Investor and Media section of the Cirrus' website at www.cirrus.com. We will begin the call with prepared remarks by Conley Chi, our Chief Executive Officer, Dr. David Roth, our Chief Medical Officer, and Jason Haas, our Chief Financial Officer. We will then open the call for questions. Kristen Stevens, our Chief Development Officer, is also here on the call and will be available for Q&A. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that the statements we make on this conference call will include forward-looking statements. Actual events or results could differ materially from those expressed or implied by any forward-looking statements as a result of various risks, uncertainties, and other factors, including those set forth in the risk factors section of our annual report on Form 10-K that we filed this morning and any other filings that we may make with the SEC in the future. Any forward-looking statements represent our views only as of today and should not be relied upon as representing our views as of any subsequent date. We specifically disclaim any obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements. With that, I would now like to turn the call over to Conley. Conley? Thank you, Karen. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Late last year, we announced the initial data from our select AML1 trial. And since then, we've continued to make great progress in our effort to become a commercial stage biotech company. Following our initial AML data, we completed an equity financing of approximately $45 million, reinforcing our cash position and providing us ample resources as we enter into 2024. This year will be a critical one in our evolution. With expected pivotal data from our select MDS-1 trial, as well as additional randomized data from our select AML1 trial. And we're excited to share with you that we've completed enrollment of the 190 patients necessary for our primary endpoint analysis in our select MDS1 phase three trial. And we remain on track to report pivotal CR data by the middle of Q4 this year. If successful, these data will allow us to file our first NDA and ultimately to deliver tamiveratine to the approximately 50% of higher risk MDS patients with RARA overexpression in need of better options. Just as a reminder, our strategy is to launch tamiveratine in the US with our own specialty sales force. And we continue to make great progress against our launch plan. We look forward to sharing more details on our commercial plan as we get closer to our pivotal data readout. As we've discussed previously, we believe tamiveratine has the potential to bring about a transformational change for these patients by offering a unique and targeted new standard of care for the frontline treatment of hematologic malignancies. Our growing body of evidence indicates that tamiveratine consistently produces impressive response rates with a rapid time to response, and it's generally well tolerated. We're excited to push forward with our program, and we'll be sure to keep you up to date as we progress throughout the year. With that, I now turn the call over to David to review our programs and our upcoming milestones in more detail. David? Thank you, Conley. We are very encouraged by the development of Tammy Baratine and the potential for our targeted agent to improve the frontline treatment of higher risk MDS and AML patients with RARA overexpression. As Conley mentioned, in December of last year, we got our first look at the initial data from the ongoing randomized portion of the select AML1 phase two study. The objective of this study is to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the triplet regimen 
of tamubaratine in combination with venetoclax and azacitidine compared to venetoclax and azacitidine in approximately 80 patients randomized one to one. The initial data included 23 patients with 19 response available and demonstrated a 100% CRCRI rate in patients treated with the triplet regimen of tamubaratine, venetoclax, and azacitidine as compared to 70% among patients treated with venetoclax and azacitidine alone. Importantly, 78% of the responses among patients treated with the triplet were complete responses, or CRs, compared to only 30% among patients treated with the venaza combination alone. The time to response was rapid across both arms, with 100% of patients in the triplet arm responding by the end of cycle one, compared with 60% in the doublet arm. Not only was the AML data encouraging from an efficacy standpoint, but the safety profile was compelling as well. Consistent with prior clinical experience, tamibaratine in combination with approved doses of venetoclax and azacitidine was generally well tolerated, and the overall safety profile demonstrated no additive toxicities or new safety signals. Importantly, we also saw no evidence of increased myelosuppression in the triplet arm compared to the doublet. We're very encouraged by these initial results which strongly support the potential of tamibaratine in combination with standard of care in the frontline treatment of AML patients with RARA overexpression. And we look forward to sharing additional data later this year. We also believe the high CR rates in our AML study support the potential for tamibaratine to deliver complete responses in our ongoing select MDS-1 trial, which has a primary endpoint based on CR. Turning to MDS, our phase three select MDS-1 trial is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial evaluating the combination of tamibaratine and azacitidine versus placebo and azacitidine in newly diagnosed higher risk MDS patients with RARA overexpression. As Conley mentioned, we recently completed enrollment of the 190 patients necessary to support the complete response rate primary endpoint analysis. And we are on target to report pivotal data by mid fourth quarter of this year. As a reminder, we're continuing to enroll patients in the trial to support the key secondary endpoint of overall survival. This approach allows us to potentially secure accelerated approval and subsequent conversion to full approval if needed. By integrating both primary and confirmatory endpoints into a single trial, we ensure we execute more efficiently and believe this increases the probability of success of the overall study. We believe tamibaratine has the potential to be the first novel agent approved for the treatment of higher risk MDS in over a decade. In that time, the only approved therapies are hypomethylating agents, or HMAs, which provide limited efficacy of a 17% CR rate and a median overall survival of just 18.6 months, highlighting the critical need for new treatment options for this patient population. We look forward to delivering pivotal CR data by the mid-fourth quarter of this year and evaluating the potential of tamibaratine to meaningfully improve upon the standard of care and deliver improved treatment outcomes for patients with higher risk MDS. I would now like to turn the call over to Jason to review our fourth quarter and full year financial results. Jason? Thank you, David. We continue to be well capitalized to fund the ongoing development of Tamibaratine. In December 2023, we completed an equity financing, which resulted in gross proceeds to Ciros of approximately $45 million before underwriting discounts, commissions, and offering expenses. The financing included new and existing investors, including Bain Capital Life Sciences, Ciro's co-founder and founding investor, Flagship Pioneering, Adage Capital Partners, Invis, Samsara Biocapital, Deep Track Capital, Blue Owl Healthcare Opportunities, Daphne Capital Management, as well as a life sciences-focused investment fund. We are grateful to our investors for their continued support. We believe our current cash position will be sufficient to fund our anticipated operating expenses and capital expenditure requirements into the second quarter of 2025 beyond our pivotal phase three data from the select MDS-1 trial and additional data from the randomized portion of the select AML 
one trial. Now, turning to our fourth quarter and full year 2023 financial results. Revenues were $400,000 for the fourth quarter of 2023 and $9.9 million for the year ended December 31st, 2023, as compared to negative $800,000 in the fourth quarter of 2022 and $14.9 million for the year ended December 31, 2022. The increase for the fourth quarter of 2023 compared to the same period of 22 was driven primarily by the negative cumulative cash up adjustments recognized in the fourth quarter of 2022. The decrease for the year reflects the termination of the collaboration agreement with Pfizer GBT in October 2023. R&D expenses were $21.5 million for the fourth quarter of 2023 and $108.2 million for the full year 2023 as compared to $27.9 million for the fourth quarter of 22 and $111.9 million for the full year 2022. The decrease for the fourth quarter of 2023 compared to the same period in 22 and the decrease for the year were primarily due to a reduction in employee-related expenses, consulting and professional fees, and other facilities-related costs. The decrease in these costs were driven by the restructuring of our operations to prioritize key development and pre-launch activities to advance Tamiveratine. G&A expenses were $5.9 million for the fourth quarter of 2023 and $28.3 million for the full year of 2023, as compared to $7.3 million for the fourth quarter of 2022 and $29.3 million for the full year of 2022. The decrease for the fourth quarter of 2023 compared to the same period in 22 and the decrease for the year were primarily due to consulting and other professional fees and facility costs. We reported a net loss for the fourth quarter of $64.4 million or $2.18 per share compared to a net loss of $4.8 million or $0.17 per share for the same period in 2022. For the full year ended December 31st, 2023, Ceros reported a net loss of $164.6 million, or $5.81 per share, compared to a net loss of $94.7 million, or $7.49 per share, for the same period in 2022. Cash and cash equivalents as of December 31, 2023, were $139.5 million, as compared with cash, cash equivalents and marketable securities of $202.3 million at the end of 2022. With that, I will turn the call over to the operator for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Should you have a question, please press star, followed by the number one on your touchstone phone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledging your request. Should you wish to decline from the polling process, please press star, followed by the number 2. If you are using a speakerphone, please lift your hands up before pressing any keys. Our first question comes from the line of Phil Nadeau from TD Callen. Please go ahead. Good morning. Congratulations on completion of enrollment, and thanks for taking our questions. Uh, a couple from us. First, <clears throat> in terms of the data that we're going to see in Q4, can you discuss on the, the complete response endpoint, um, maybe in a bit more detail, your discussions with the regulatory agencies about how that could support an FDA filing, and um, how does duration of response factor into the regulatory authority's evaluation of the, uh, the CR data? Uh, thanks, Phil, uh, for that question. Uh, it's David here. And uh, what I can say is that um, the complete response is a very important clinically meaningful endpoint because it's associated with hematologic improvement. And heme improvement is really the um, clinical outcome that reverses a lot of the side effects and complications of higher risk MDS. And that's why clinical um, complete responses are an important surrogate for clinical benefit and a, a well understood correlate to overall survival. So in that context, we chose the CR as the primary endpoint We've had discussions with the FDA on more than one occasion where the nature of our primary endpoint was um, part of the dialogue. And uh, we have received confirmation that the CR uh, can support a regulatory decision as a primary endpoint for either a full approval or an accelerated approval. 
And of course, the uh, durability of that remission uh, is considered when they make that, that call. So, uh, you know, we, you know, we feel very confident that this is an important, um, you know, uh, endpoint for us to focus on, and it enables us to deliver an approval in a meaningful time frame. You know, so here we are, we've enrolled our 190 patients. Uh, we're continuing the study, as you all know, toward our key secondary endpoint, which requires 550, and we're well on our way to delivering uh, the, the top line data in the middle of the fourth quarter. In other um, trials in MDS and, or AML, the bar for duration of response seems to be somewhere in the five to six month range. Is that is that a reasonable expectation in MDS as, in, in select MDS one as well, or is, are there other data points that we should be considering? So uh, you're correct. Uh, the um, the duration of response. Um, in some of the more recent approvals has been like in the five and a half month range uh, over time that can uh, increase with additional data and a longer term follow up. Um, and I think really what determines um, a meaningful duration is one of those um, assessments that requires looking at the total data package. Uh, so obviously a fleeting response that, you know, you can only measure once and then doesn't last, you know, would probably not be considered clinically important whereas one that lasts um, over time, uh, which provides the opportunity for benefit to the patient would be. And so I'm sure the agency will look at not only the duration, but you know, the time to response, uh, the quality of the response, um, you know, again, how durable it is. And then uh, all of that in the context of the safety. Uh, so you, know, you need to uh, really appreciate how much uh, you know, the safety uh, signals could contribute or detract from that quality of the response. And that's where we also have a benefit uh, in our opinion because tamivaratine has a generally well-tolerated safety profile. It's orally administered and uh, over many years in many different studies looking at it in different ways, uh, we've really uh, you know, seen nothing uh, of consequence with respect to the, the overall safety profile. And I believe that's uh, you know, where we hold a very special advantage uh, for the opportunity for patients. That's very helpful. And then one last question for Jason. Jason, based on your guidance for the cash runway into Q2 of 2025, it seems like the Q423 expenses in R&D and SG&A are a reasonable um, run rate for future quarters, at least through 2024. Is that a fair assessment, or is there any lumpiness that I'm I'm missing? Yeah, I think it's it's fair. We we've been you know kind of spending a little bit less on SG&A and um, and R&D over the last couple of quarters as we've really prioritized and focused the programs on on team for MDS and AML. There's certainly some lumpiness you know depending upon uh, you know some payables you know due to you know vendors along the way, uh, but generally speaking, I, I think it's fair to say. Um, you know, when you look at the, the Q4 numbers and, and you look at the cash that we spent, uh, that allows us to get into the second quarter of 25. That's very helpful. Thanks for taking our questions, and congrats again on completion of enrollment. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder, should you have a question, please press star, followed by the number one on your touchstone phone. We have our next question coming from the line of Jason Butler from Citizens JMP. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking the question and, and congrats on the product, this progress. I'm wondering if you could just talk about some of the, the medical affairs work and, and commercial prep that you're starting to do both for, for MDS and AML and, and just what your focus will be for the rest of, of 2024. Thanks. Uh, sure. Thanks. Why don't I uh, start off? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, let me just start off by saying some of the medical affairs work that we're doing uh, is um, really focused in the short term on uh, key opinion leader engagement, uh, meeting with uh, various healthcare organizations, and making sure uh, that the physicians who ultimately will be prescribing the drug truly understand how it works. Uh, they need to understand the thorough grounding in the biology and the data. So we're basically setting the stage for for um, an appreciation of the importance of identifying patients who have viral overexpression and then uh, being receptive to prescribing the drug uh, upon success of the trial. 
And Jason is kind of here. I can add to that um, in terms of our launch prep. As David said, the first phase of this is really around education of raw rubber expression and, and some awareness of county bear team. But also the launch team has done a great job in terms of laying the, the, the path, if you will, to uh, launch, um, which includes investments in infrastructure and uh, starting to look at um, the types of investments we'll need, uh, most of which will be gated post data. But I think we're in great shape in terms of uh, envisioning what we're going to need to uh, make it a really great launch for County Bear Team. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I'd now like to turn the call back over to Mr. Chi for final closing comments. Thank you, Operator, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We're looking forward to an exciting and productive year ahead and appreciate your continued support of CEROs. Please reach out to us if you have any further questions, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your conference call for today. We thank you for participating and ask that you please disconnect your lines. Have a lovely day.